thank you for braving the afternoon and and, and I have a tall, tall challenge after all the excellent talks that have gone before me this afternoon. But I will wind up the afternoon in the next 15 minutes or so. And we shall talk briefly about renal replacement therapies in, in patients like the ones that were presented today. As Arthur Quizera said, this is something that could last hours. But I will try to do a 15 minute summary of, of of what we can do. The ISN decided that I should disclose that it funded my fellowship, uh, which greatly improved my clinical knowledge. But there's no research work done here. So this, shortly after I returned, I, I was invited to participate, to join some Ebola training. And I wanted to run away. I didn't know why they were inviting me to participate. But it turns out that Ebola is the ultimate sepsis. And the reason why it kills so many people is that as it does its uh, extreme damage to all of these organs, it also injures the kidney. And, and, we found, and what they are finding is that, uh, is that being able to deal with the AKI, they think that it, it will improve and cut down these, these dramatic mortality rates that we see from Ebola. And, and this is about one of the patients who was treated in the States. Uh, they did dialysis in him. I found it uh, challenging. I was asking myself how they did it, how they spent all these hours with, a, with an Ebola patient. But there are many new tricks coming out. It's an exciting space. If you get cold, don't, don't shy away. Uh, there are good vaccines and there are smart ways to deal with it now. So away from the frontiers of Ebola, we'll just talk about what we can do in our space. I found this online, uh, what's dialysis, separation of substances in solution by really taking advantage of unequal diffusion through semi-permeable semi membranes. The second definition there is from a long time ago. The, the, the beginnings of dialysis uh, when it relied on arterial pressure to drive, to drive blood through a circuit. But now we don't take blood from arteries anymore. We routinely insert our catheters in, into a vein and then we have a pump drive the blood through our dialysis circuit. So we've got two main dialysis, two, two, two main divisions in dialysis. We've got hemodialysis. And, and it's many children, and then we've got peritoneal dialysis. When we are doing hemodialysis, what happens is that, uh, is that we insert a catheter in a big vein, typically the internal jugular vein. So, uh, many times the femoral vein is also used because, because, of, because people find it easier. Many people uh, starting out will find it easier. And then we take this blood to a dialyzer membrane and the dialyzer membrane is, is, a machine is holding the dialyzer membrane and making a special dialysis solution. So at that machine, the blood is bathed with the dialysis solution where you, the doctor, have influenced the decision to get a desired outcome. Uh, and then we can also influence how much water, uh, the fluid status of the patient by, by, uh, by a setting that exerts hydrostatic pressure across that membrane and kind of uh, it pushes fluid out. So it's almost like copying the styling forces that you see in a capillary bed. Uh, so this is a cartoon that I drew. Dr. Yoko, please don't mark my art. But we've got a patient who's got a catheter sitting in his right atrium and it's drawing blood. And if you look at the cross section, I draw a cross section there. So it's, it's, the catheter is one tube, but it's really got two divisions in there. And one is taking blood to our dialyzer membrane, and the other one is returning the blood. On the other side, I've drawn the dialyzer membrane. So blood's getting in at the top and breaking down into those very small streams. Because what you have in there are, are semi-permeable capillary, capillary lumens. So the blood's going through these very tiny pores and it's being bathed by a dialysis solution that's flowing 
in the other direction. Again, so the blood's coming in with its impurities, high potassium, a lot of acid, um, high uremic wastes. And as it goes through, it's encountering fresh dialysis where you have chosen what you want to be in it. So you want to give the patient a lower potassium, and so you set that lower. You want to give, get rid of acidosis, so you give the patient bicarb. I will meet that time. Um, and so, um, at the end, you expect to achieve a more physiological balance uh, after this process. And you can decide how much exactly you want to do by varying the length of the session, varying the nature of the dialyzer membrane that you use and the size of the dialyzer membrane, by varying the rate of the blood flow that you deliver to the patient, by varying the rate of the dialysis flow, and by whether you, you, you do additional things like hemofiltration, in which you, kind of, you dilute the patient, uh, patient's blood and then you drive, it across the drive fluid across the membrane faster than you'd have had if you had not diluted it. Uh, but to, to be able to play, ar play around all of these, these details, you will need equipment. And the kind of equipment you have will influence what you can deliver to the patient. Um, and the, the exact settings in there will vary. And conventionally, what we most commonly do is what's in the first row, what's called intermittent hemodialysis, which is what we borrow from people with chronic renal failure. Typically, they run for about four hours with high blood flows and high dialysate flows. If you look at the CRRT that Arthur has been talking about, typically they have very low dialysis flows and that's the limit, that's, that's the main difference as we deliver this, this therapy. And, and it's not very widely available here. We've got one machine so far. We'll probably get three new ones when Mulago opens. Uh, so we do, in Chirudu, we do 40, dialysis, 40 hemodialysis sessions a day. That's how experienced we are. And, and, and yet, last year in, in Uganda, I did one CRRT patient. So 40 patients a day versus one, and that, that's how, how little we have. But our patients survived, so 100%. <laughs> So, so because of the restrictions that, that we have with our conventional hemodialysis machines over the last 20 years or so, people have played around with the settings and delivered what has been given many names. So we call them hybrid therapies, other people call them SLED, and then SLED also has many meanings, although the letters are the same, and other people say prolonged intermittent renal replacement therapies. But what these, try to, this, the, what these try to do is to, to adapt what equipment that might be used for regular intermittent hemodialysis for sicker patients by lowering the blood flow and lowering the dialysis flow. We, we still have trouble though. The most common machines that we have here are not able to play the games we want to play in the dialysis flow range. So most of our dialysis machines will stop at 300 ml per minute. They will not drop as, uh, as low as 100 ml. I don't know if Ogavu's equipment is able to drop that low, but, but all of our equipment in Bulawayo cannot drop. So, so we, we really cannot vary our sled prescription as much as we would like. Uh, so beyond blood flow and dialysis flow rates, there are other diff difference and length of session, there are other differences. Intermittent hemodialysis is the most efficient if you want to remove. The first patient had the potassium of 7.8 on the first day. So if my priority was to get that potassium out fast, then intermittent hemodialysis would be my go-to thing. Um, uh, but it's not very great for hemodynamically unstable patients you can get away with little anticoagulation or often none. It's still costly. The hybrid therapies are almost like, the, because the equipment is about the same as the IHD, the relative advantages are, it's just you deciding to be less efficient. The continuous 
hemodialysis variations where you have continuous hemodialysis and hemofiltration and hemodialfiltration. They are all children of CRRT. They are all variants of CRRT. For that reason, they are all very costly. I gave them four stars for cost. You need to anticoagulate more because typically you're running at lower blood flow rates and that makes it easy for the blood to clot outside the circuit. So you need, a, you need more anticoagulants. It is acknowledged that the CRRT, <coughs> patients on CRRT are more hemodynamically stable than patients on intermittent hemodialysis. On intermittent hemodialysis. And, and that's really why they are favored around many, many ICUs. The hybrid therapies have bridged the gap though. And we, we achieved fair, fair, reasonable, reasonable hemodynamical hemodynamic stability with the hybrid therapies. And there are many ICUs, including in the West, that, that now routinely do variant sleds or hybrid therapies uh, for their ICU care. And just looking at the duration, the typical length of a session, what this, what this 24 to 72 hours means is that when we get three machines, if we had three patients, they could keep those machines busy for the next three days. And if you have many, many septic patients, then you really don't have room to work. You cannot, well, maybe I'll save, I'll save the most, I don't know, I'll have to play God, but, but it will not be a good thing. So, so I feel that eventually we must be able to play in the hybrid space. We must be able to play in the hybrid space. We have to get equipment that allows us to play in that space. We must uh, work with the ICU to see how we adapt this, this part. This is what the dialysis equipment looks like. That's a CRRT machine. It comes with its own pre-packed dialysis. That also makes the costs very expensive. Our conventional dialysis machine gets uh, water from a treatment plant and then you know, mixes the uh, acid concentrate and bicarbonate to, to make fresh dialysate for you. But that you've got to buy and you've got to ship it sometimes from Germany. And although it's a solution of water, if you're going to carry water from Germany, it's going to cost you. <laughs> so onward to peritoneal dialysis. Typically we think about this as a chronic thing, but we know, but we know that it has been used for acute kidney injury. And speaking as a member of the International Society of Nephrology, there's a drive to get this adapted more because, well, if I had three CRRT machines, they are stuck in Mulago. If I had people who knew, if this entire room knew how to do peritoneal dialysis, then every corner of the country would be covered would be covered. And it's got favorable effects on the hemodynamic status. We don't struggle with hypotension so much. All we need is a well-inserted dialysis catheter and dialysis solution. We don't need a machine. We can use a machine if we have it. We can play some games and make the exchanges shorter. But, and this is why many people have been championing it for a long time. But, but I think they, we imagine that it would be easier than it has been to implement this. So we are not doing it because it's hard to deliver. It looks easy, but well, we've got to trade carefully. So this is what it looks like. You, this is a well patient, of course. It's not an acute patient. But standing up and you have what's called a twin bag system, you hang up the fresh bag and fluid is instilled into the peritoneal cavity. The peritoneal membrane is your dialyzer membrane this time. Yeah. So you're not buying a dialyzer. The peritoneum is what's going to be your medium of exchange and things diffuse into that fluid. And after a period that you have decided, you drain and the fluid goes into the bag. And you can influence how much water you want to remove by varying the strength of the dextrose solution in there. 
So, um, sometimes you get complications, uh, make it harder to control your blood sugar. The solutions don't typically have potassium in them. So, in this set of patients, the problem is hypokalemia rather than hyperkalemia. There's also hypo, hypophosphatemia. And then one of the fears that have pervaded is the fear of infections. Uh, and I, I don't know the whole story, but I know that there's reluctance to tread in this space. <laughs> so which patient will need AKI? Your typical patient who needs AKI will have KDGO stage three, AKI and life-threatening complications without response to conservative measures and usually you don't anticipate recovery the next day. You, you think that uh, you're in for a, for a tough time and, and this is when you start. So the absolute indications for dialysis are severe hyperkalemia, severe metabolic acidosis, uremic complications, pulmonary edema, refractory fluid overload, and sometimes you need to remove toxins. Arthur was talking about lactic acid. Uh, sometimes it's not just from hypotension, especially in our diabetic patients. Sometimes you have uh, metformin that has gone on for too long because it will block the Cori cycle and that's exactly when, when, when you'll be able to, when, when you will see the, the classic story of metformin associated lactic acidosis. How much time? I'm being sent away, but, but yeah. there are risks associated with dialysis. So you shouldn't rush into dialysis because sometimes you run into trouble. Hypotension, hypothermia, arrhythmias. Uh, you may not want to use a lot of anticoagulants because of coexisting bleeding risks. What's the evidence? When should we start? So some people are trying to do what's like a preemptive start to dialysis so that as soon as you register stage three AKI, they start you on dialysis. And because 10 years ago, we didn't know which was the perfect strategy. The studies were observational, and they were not great. So some people felt that there was equipoise. In the last 10 years, we've had three trials and we've got another one ongoing. The most relevant one to, to to sepsis is this uh, the ideal ICU trial came out 2018 and to stop because of futility. The people who waited for the indications to develop, the, the traditional indications for dialysis to develop, fared uh, the, the group that followed the standard way we practice fared the same as the one that started early. And so, and so uh, I think this is what Arthur was talking about. But there are two other trials. There's a bigger one coming out. The biggest one is, 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 is still ongoing. Um, one of them, the first one, suggested that the early strategy would be superior, but it was a one-center trial, and, and there was probably some bias in that. Two, two studies since then have, been, have swung us the other way. Does the dialysis mortality affect the eventual outcome? So we're talking about CRRT. Uh, and intermittent hemodialysis and the hybrid therapies, but there have been no clear trial data to demonstrate that CRRT gives us better outcomes in AKI than, than intermittent hemo. <coughs> Although we know that you will have a tougher time, you, your patient will be hemodynamically more unstable if you try to go just IHD. And so it's prudent to, to practice with, with, to play in the range, especially as the hemodynamic status allows you. How much dialysis does your patient need? This is a paper from more than 10 years ago, but what it was really doing is to compare uh, an intensive therapy where, you, let's say, you do sled every day of the week, six days of the week, and take a break just on Sunday, versus a less intensive therapy where you do treatments three times a week. Um, so, you can see that there is CRRT and SLED and intermittent hemodialysis in either arm. But what was real, the question was really the dose of dialysis you're delivering rather than the modality. And you just swing between the modalities as your hemodynamics allowed. Again, there was no extra benefit for doing more dialysis. So you could get away with three days 
we, we slept three three days a week and and do the same as someone who's dad, done it every day of the week what can we do we are still doing a lot of hemodialysis we are trying to play in the hybrid therapy space and do sled uh, as i said we've got just one crrt machine that hasn't been very active because it, it can bankrupt you yeah. and we need smarter ways to fund our care Peritoneal dialysis is a conversation that will not die because it offers a lot of promise and, and we will find ways to do it better. In summary, dialysis is indicated for severe AKI stage 3 with complications and it's reasonable to, to practice using a delayed start approach to dialysis. You can use both hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis for AKI and a higher dialysis dose may not necessarily be better for your patient. And I'll end with this slide. You cannot see the Nyankore words there, but someone is writing in Kari and uh, 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 doing a very good job monitoring the ins and outs. So, so I kept this on my phone. You can see how This girl survived.